better stand. Understanding Medicine I am Professor Azizur Rahman and today we are going to take up this condition called bronchial asthma. I am sure you have seen cases with this condition because it is fairly common. From occasional symptomatology to a very serious condition called status asthmatic as we have all the variety. So a good understanding of this condition is essential. Only then you can handle these cases well. So let's start with the definition. If we consider just the clinical presentation or the history of the patient, I think it can be defined as paroxysm of dyspnea, cough and wheezing, implying that there is symptom free intervals. Patient may be absolutely asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic and then patient gets an attack. Paroxysm of course means attack of dyspnea which is shortness of breath associated with cough which may be dry or may be associated with some expectoration and wheeze. Wheeze is the whistling sound which patient describes. So if these symptoms come intermittently with the symptom free interval, the diagnosis of asthma is very likely. So this is purely based on symptoms. Pathophysiological diagnosis, uh, it is a disease which is characterized by generalized and reversible airway nerve. So both lungs are affected. Uh, it's not disease of one lobe or one lung. It is the involvement of the entire pulmonary structure and there is marked airway obstruction and that is at least theoretically reversible or at least potentially reversible. So this is to differentiate it from other types of obstructive airway diseases where airway obstruction or narrowing is not reversible or minimally reversible. So whenever somebody comes with airway obstruction, so we decide if it is reversible or if it is not. If it is significantly reversible, it would be called asthma. If it is not reversible, then it would be some other condition. So this is the pathophysiological. Uh, I'm not actually talking about the pathology, so just uh, the effect of the underlying disease that is generalized bronchospasm. And this would be uh, evident as presence of generalized ronchi. Ronchi are whistling sounds which are not present in a normal healthy person. Only when this marked airway narrowing you get this abnormal sound which is called ronchi. Pathology, I think this point is emphasized more and more that this is actually a chronic inflammatory state of airways. So why is it important? Because the focus has shifted from simple bronchodilators to anti-inflammatory, some specific anti-inflammatory drugs which work on the airways. So if there's a chronic low-grade inflammation, of course, there are some circumstances which can increase inflammation, seasonal change or some viral infection, some allergens. They increase inflammation and it causes bronchial hyperreactivity. Now, our normal bronchi, they would react to irritants even if you are healthy. But if there is increased hyperreactivity, that would mean that even little change in uh, temperature of the air, little uh, dust, little smoke would cause exaggerated response and there would be marked bronchoconstrictions. So this a uh, physiological phenomenon of bronchial uh, reactivity is actually enhanced many times when there is inflammation and inflammation is caused by some genetic factors and some viral infections, some allergens, some pollutants, so they are all are very, very relevant here. Classification of asthma. 
uh, it may be allergic or atopic atopic is also the same as allergic now this is the majority people and in you know asthma typically occurs at a very young age and at the age where usually children are not exposed to environment pollutants at, at least not the industrial level and they are not smokers so this is mostly allergic uh, about i think 85 percent people with asthma they have their symptoms in the childhood and if you do further testing you will have some evidence of allergy or atopy behind their symptoms in some cases it may be non-allergic and it is also called idiosyncratic we don't really know what is the cause perhaps there is some genetic factor in this case also but bronchospasm is uh, triggered by some non-allergic or some non-immune mechanism and this can occur at later age also and this could actually be less responsive to the treatment because uh, here we address anti uh, with immunotherapy here immunotherapy is less effective so this is maybe potentially more serious but luckily in about 15 percent so majority would have allergy and some would have uh, this idiosyncratic variant then there are other variants like exercise induced uh, we do not understand the exact mechanism uh, perhaps this is there is actually theory but i will not go into that detail by definition uh, exercise induced asthma is somebody who is asymptomatic but only during exercise or after exercise not actually during but after exercise this attack of asthma comes in so typically attack of asthma is triggered by exercise occupational this is you due to some pollutants aspirin some people they get attack uh, after aspirin intake and then there's a variant called status asthmaticus any any asthma attack can become serious and that is called status asthmaticus if patient does not recover from acute severe attack or goes into acute attacks very frequently it could be life threatening and that is a called status asthmaticus now let's briefly talk about pathophysiology every person does not have uh, these attacks even if exposed to these potential allergens so there is some predisposition and this predisposition is in the form of atopy so usually there is a family history family history of asthma or family history of some other atopic disorder like allergic rhinitis dermatitis something like that so that pretty predisposed person when exposed to some triggering factors which is usually uh, some allergen and you know allergens they are environment related weather related so depending upon to what agent one is allergic so in that uh, the, that season uh, one would develop asthma symptoms for example somebody is allergic to a particular pollen and that particular pollen comes in certain flowers which is there only in certain season so those triggering factor would precipitate asthma other other triggering factor like respiratory tract infection not necessarily low respiratory tract infection even upper respiratory tract infection nasal infection pharyngeal infection viral bacterial infection all can trigger these attacks now these triggering factors in a predisposed person cause this uh, uh, causes this inflammation of the airways because of this inflammation the bronchial mucosa becomes hyper reactive even little change in the temperature or little smoke little dust little pollens in the airways would trigger uh, bronchospasm so this is the pathophysiology of asthma now we then have to block this mechanism of course we probably cannot intervene here because if you have a predisposition uh, this is usually genetic so there isn't much that we can do about it but we can control triggering factors i think these days there is more and more emphasis to control 
triggering factor so that patient does not develop acute attacks. But if somebody does attack and does develop acute attack, then we uh, we try to control bronchial asthma by giving bronchodilators and uh, steroids. So the, the earlier the better. Most of the treatments these days, preventive treatments would work here. But then abortive treatment, if somebody does develop attack, then we have to work here also. Clinical features onset at young age and usually there is a positive family history of either asthma or some other atopic disorder. And paroxysm of dyspnea wheeze with symptom free periods. Uh, the, it could be absolutely symptom free or there may be minimal symptom. There are people who would have no symptom for months and maybe sometimes years and only occasionally when they, whenever they are exposed to the triggering factors, they develop acute attack. So it would vary from patient to patient. Respiratory difficulty, especially during expiration. The patient's symptom is primarily dyspnea and patient would have difficulty exhaling uh, during uh, expiration. Because of some uh, physiological mechanism, uh, because you know, in a normal person, inspiration is active, expiration is passive. We simply allow our uh, elastic recoil of the muscle and the chest cage and the lungs to to allow this expiration. But in patient with asthma, because that is usually not sufficient to produce an effective expiration so we use our excessive accessory muscle when accessory muscles are used they would generate pressure to help this expiration but they would also cause some bronchial constriction so due to this reason patient typically would have a problem more problem during expiration so this might be helpful to differentiate this condition from other uh, lung diseases which may present with dyspnea generalized ronchi sinuses during attack and uh, there is generalized mean you auscultate the lungs from front or back the apices bases middle zone you would hear ronchi on both sides and there may be sinuses of course sinuses is a clinic finding you need to develop significant hypoxia to develop sinuses but if you examine the patient carefully during an attack, many people would have sinuses. Sinuses is a blue discoloration of uh, a, a skin and conjunctivi and, and all mucosal surfaces. In asthma, if you have sinuses, it would obviously be central sinuses. Then reversibility, this is very important clinical features, you know, with or without medication. Sometimes patient gets an attack Patient does not seek medical advice, but after some time, patient recovers from attack. So this is a spontaneous recovery. And most patients would use medication, medication in the form of pills or uh, inhalers or nebulizers. So that medication will help to reverse the asthma attack. Of course, there are cases where reversibility may be partial or no reversibility at all. You have to demonstrate this reversibility and this is actually one of the diagnostic features also. We perform pulmonary function tests and then we give nebulized or aerosolized bronchodilator and after some time we repeat that uh, pulmonary function test. If there is minimum 15% improvement in, in the parameters of airway obstruction, that means it is irreversible. And the diagnosis of acute attack of asthma is very simple. Now patient has dyspnea. Uh, patient would have more dyspnea during expiration. Patient may be so much dyspneic that he, he or she may not be able to actually speak properly or at least complete a sentence. So you can judge from the very looks of the patient how severe or bad is the asthma attack. Patient would have usually dry cough and wheeze. This is a symptomatology and you can auscultate the chest and you can hear generalized ronchi. And this is equivalent of wheeze. 
generalized ronchi. I would like to emphasize one point that ronchi are present all over. If they are present only in one area, then you should rule out something else like foreign body, some bronchial obstruction due to some growth or some mucus plug or it could be actually a complication of asthma also. But we expect generalized ronchi. And there is a word called silent chest. If somebody is severely symptomatic, has got severe dyspnea, but on auscultation you do not hear ronchi, or ronchi are minimal, this is described as silent chest. This is actually more serious condition. That means there is so much bronchial obstruction that there is no air entry and there are no ronchi. And patient may be at the verge of collapse. So absence of ronchi could be actually a serious sign if patient has other symptoms of asthma. Silent chest, that is what is meant by silent chest. Cyanosis, if present, would be central. Uh, uh, majority patients should not have cyanosis during mild to moderate attack because you need severe hypoxia. I think one needs to have uh, arterial oxygen partial pressure coming below 60 to develop cyanosis. So that is very significant hypoxemia. So cyanosis is present only in severe cases and if present it would be central. Present everywhere and extremities when you examine them would be warm. Laboratory features, uh, although most of the patients with asthma, they, the diagnosis is very clear on history and on physical examination. But let's discuss laboratory abnormalities also to complete the module. Now, pulmonary function tests are done. It may not be possible to perform pulmonary function tests during an acute attack. But there are various tests. One is peak expiratory flow rate. This is a handheld device and patient is asked to breathe into, uh, exhale forcefully into this device after taking a full inspiration and this would record the peak flow and that is compared with normal. This is formal spirometry, a forced expiratory volume during first second. Both are, this would require a proper instrument. This is just a simple mechanical device. So this would of course uh, is better and this is both are recorded and with the management, we expect them to, uh, both those features to improve. So we can assess the severity of acute attack and also we can see the prognosis. Now with the time, with treatment, these parameters need, uh, should improve. As I said, diagnosis is usually so obvious, we do not need to perform these tests in emergency state because when patient is fighting for breathing, it is also not right to ask him to hold breath and then forcefully exhale because patient is usually not able to perform this test. X-ray, again, not usually required for the diagnosis, but X-ray should be done whenever patient has this acute attack of asthma to rule out some complications of asthma, like atelectasis, like pneumothorax, and that should be, I think, ruled out, especially in severe cases. Uh, XHS may look just like normal or there may be some hyperinflation. Arterial blood gases not done in every patient because these days we have this simple non-invasive monitoring of saturation of oxygen. Uh, so we usually monitor uh, this pulse oximetry but in some cases arterial blood gases should be done especially the serious one patient with status asthmaticus in those patients not only arterial blood gases are recommended they are actually done serially to see the prognosis so the result would be variable i'm going to just discuss briefly ph there are three parameters which are directly observed by the uh, pulmonary, uh, this arterial blood gas, pH is mostly normal. Mostly during acute attack, uncomplicated acute attack, 
or when patient is not in attack, the pH is likely to be normal and then it may be high. Why high? Because during acute attack, patient hyperventilates. Patient hyperventilates in response to hypoxia and as a result of hyperventilation, patient washes out his or her carbon dioxide. So because carbon dioxide is an acid, so removal of carbon dioxide from the system would result in high pH that is alkaline pH. It may be low also, this would occur only in very advanced cases when somebody develops a respiratory failure. Because of ultimately patient gets exhausted and there is hypoventilation, carbon dioxide gets accumulated, there may be element of metabolic acidosis also, so the pH becomes low. A low pH, acidic pH in a case of asthma would be actually very, very serious state. Oxygen, now you may be surprised here that majority of the patient with uh, asthma attack, their oxygen level may be either normal or only slightly hypoxic. Now why normal? Because they have this ability to compensate. They are breathing at a much higher rate and their tidal volume, they're trying to breathe fast and force so to keep their oxygen level normal. They may be hypoxic, of course they could be severe hypoxia, they could be mild to moderate hypo hypoxia. This can be measured with oxygen, arterial blood gas or with, with the, this pulse oximetry. And carbon dioxide, most patients at the time of presentation during an acute attack, they have hypocapnia. I have already explained because of hyperventilation, their carbon dioxide is washed out and that results in low carbon dioxide. So typically during a good attack, you would expect carbon dioxide into, into 20s, maybe around 30 millimeter mercury, which is much below normal. So if patient gets tired and patient is developing a respiratory failure, it would first becomes normal and then hypercapnic. So normal carbon dioxide uh, pressure, partial pressure during an acute attack of asthma would be something serious. This could actually be an indication of intubation. Hypercapnia is surely an indication for intubation, but even normal oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide when patient is in acute attack would indicate that patient might be going into this stage and uh, intubation may be required. Intubation uh, is needed for artificial ventilation. So this is the arterial blood gas, very useful in serious conditions and severe asthma. Then IgE, uh, those patients who have allergic or atopic asthma, IgE level is increased. Now this is non-specific Ig level and there's a lot of uh, this wide range, but we expect IgE to be increased and there are some allergen specific IgEs also that is possible in some cases and that will help you to find out the actual precipitating fact. Now just some more detail about the pulmonary function. Pulmonary function test I think is a test a spirometry. Now this is the normal curve. Uh, you are asked to breathe in and out of a device. Usually a clip is attached to the nose so that one breathes only through the mouth and into a device. These days we have electronic uh, devices. They sense the amount of flow which goes out or comes in and also the pressure and the volumes. So this is for example inspiration and this is expiration. Just imagine this is a curve. Patient has been asked to take a full inspiration and then full expiration, okay? So this is the normal. In a normal person, one is able to exhale about 75 or 80% of the total uh, volume uh, during expiration, the first second. So because our airways are wide enough, they are fully uh, patent, and in a normal healthy person, if one is asked to take a full inspiration, and then exhale forcefully, one is able to exhale 
75% of the tidal volume in the first second. So that is normal. But in asthma and also in other obstructive airway diseases, this is actually increased. And so this is the curve. You see, this is inspiration, but the expiration becomes much longer. This we can appreciate during our auscultation. So expiration becomes much longer. The total amount of volume exhaled may be equivalent to normal, but the time taken is too long. And the time uh, that the amount of uh, uh, volume which is exhaled during the first second is much smaller, maybe 30%, 40%. In this picture, I think it's approximately 35%. So depending upon the severity, much less than 75% is exhaled during the first second. This is called FEV1, forced expiratory volume in first second. Treatment aims are number one, to prevent attacks, and number two, if someone develops attack, then to abort it, to terminate it. So these are two, that these are two purposes. Mostly we like to prevent attacks actually. So if somebody, despite the treatment, has frequent attacks, that means this preventive treatment is not very effective. So it is done by environmental control and medication. Environmental control means patient should control his or her environment, like plants should be minimum, animal pets should be minimum in the room, and uh, rugs and uh, carpets should be to minimum and clothing should be clean, change, I think that kind of stuff and insects and cockroaches and bad bugs should be controlled. Uh, this is actually requires a separate lecture and then medication. We try to use some medication on a regular basis to avoid, to prevent these acute attacks. Now, just let me compare the systemic medication with inhaled medication. So, preventive medication can be given uh, through uh, or, uh, oral cavity, uh, can be given orally, parenterally, or can be given through inhalers and nebulizers. So, these would have systemic action, and there are more side effects because drugs are taken orally or parenterally, they circulate in the entire body and only small portion goes to the lungs where we need them and that would of course cause the improvement but then at the cost of systemic side effects. Inhaled therapy in the form of these meter dose inhalers or nebulizers, they are I think quickly effective and are perceived to be safer because their systemic side effects are much less because only small fraction of medicine is absorbed and we need only a very small dose because medicine is delivered right into the airway so very small dose is given and even smaller portion of that is absorbed so the side effects are minimal these days we have more and more of this local action medication in the form of inhalers or nebulizers and some of the devices systemic medication of course can be and uh, may be needed in some cases now this is uh, the groups of medication i'm going to briefly discuss them beta 2 agonists which are the drugs which cause bronchodilatation muscarinic antagonists they also cause bronchodilatation phosphodiesterase inhibitors usually in the form of tablets they also cause bronchodilatation and steroids they actually address the basic of disease uh, that is inflammation so in beta 2 agonists we have short acting beta 2 agonists called salbutamol and terbutaline or we have long acting beta 2 agonists salmetrol and formoterol so this is usually used to terminate acute attack and these long acting beta 2 agonists are usually used for the prevention on the long term basis because their action starts after several hours so we of course want immediate action so for that immediate action sabas and for long term action labas muscarinic antagonists there's again samas short acting muscarinic uh, antagonists like ipratropium or long acting muscarinic antagonists like 
diotropium. This would be used in the acute attack and this can be used for the prevention and also for the treatment of the acute attack. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors, theophylines, these are usually in the form of tablets or also injection. They have systemic action. The tolerability is an issue. They cause too much tachycardia and palpitation but still useful in some cases. Steroids are used both inhaled steroids and also the tablets. Uh, this is beclomethasone, prednisolone and budesonide. Prednisolone is usually in the form of tablets and beclomethasone usually in the form of inhalers and budesonide also in the form of inhaler. This is available in the tablet form also but in asthma we usually use inhaler. Now budesonide even if taken orally as, uh, it has got relatively short half-life so I think generally considered to be safer than other uh, steroids. Now let me give you a stepwise approach to the management of asthma. These are based on recent guidelines by GINA. GINA is global initiator for the treatment of acute attack of asthma. Now SABA, intermittent use of SABA, somebody who is having symptoms only occasionally and I think he, may, he, he or she may just take a short acting beta 2 agonist only when needed. Then those who have more symptoms, more severe attack, this is step by like step 1, 2, going up to step 6. So this is low dose inhaled corticosteroids and occasional use of short acting beta 2 agonist. So patient would be on a low dose inhaled corticosteroids as a monotherapy and this would prevent inflammation and this would prevent acute attacks and only in some cases when patient gets an attack uh, additional use of SABA may be recommended. More severe cases I think low dose uh, inhaled corticosteroids are combined with long acting beta 2 agonists many times as combination inhaler. We use low dose in uh, corticosteroids and long acting beta 2 agonist inhalers many uh, inhalers they have both of them this is used as primary preventive therapy and in those who do not respond they can be offered medium dose inhaled corticosteroids and labas are continued so in these two condition uh, you have noticed that saba is missing Sabas can be used, but these days there's a, a new approach called SMART approach where rather than going for a, another inhaler, patient may be instructed to increase the frequency of the, these inhalers. So patient is on low dose inhaled corticosteroids with lava, say one puff twice a day, patient is stable on that. and patient develops an acute attack or the symptom gets worse, patient may be instructed to increase the frequency and the dosage. From one twice a day, one can use two twice a day, two three times a day or maximum two four times a day. So these are usually inhaled corticosteroids either beclomethasone or budesonide and with the long acting beta 2 agonist which is usually formatron. So these inhalers are used but of course in some cases addition of SABA may also be required. In more severe cases, high dose inhaled corticosteroid with, lama, with LABA and LAMA both. Here we have LABA, so we have LABA and LAMA both with inhaled corticosteroids. And if patient requires even more intensification of treatment, then oral corticosteroids are used. So we go stepwise. Of course, we do not want to give unnecessarily stronger medication so we go stepwise and we can also come back once patient recovers from acute attack we always try to come back patient is given instructions how to adjust the dosage and patient can escalate the medication or come down as condition improves the objective is to keep it to the minimum with acceptable symptomatology of course uh, we want to keep patient as symptom free as possible because uh, if patient remains symptomatic, not only his quality of life will be affected, 
that could also add the irreversible component. So I think medication is essential. One slide to show the mechanism of action of bronchodilator. Basic purpose is to increase the level of cyclic AMP. Now cyclic AMP uh, production, we can increase its production by giving certain medication or we can reduce its degradation uh, or we may try to do both. So beta 2 agonists, uh, they typically increase the production of cyclic AMP and this aminophylline, theophylines, they in, in, uh, reduce the degradation. So if we combine beta 2 agonists with oral theophylline, that would have additional bronchodilator action. And in our society, this theophylline is fairly popular because very cheap and the tolerability generally is good. Now these are examples of inhalers. I just thought that I'll show you this is inhaler patient is that these modern inhalers you do not need to shake and patient is taught the right technique. Uh, during inspiration, first patient is asked to exhale and then inhale and while patient is taking a breath in, we uh, the patient is uh, in, the presses the button and this compressed uh, medication goes with inhalation. This is the device that there is actually, uh, this is a different technique, but this is inhaled. Uh, patient is asked to, after loading the dose, patient is asked to take a deep inspiration from it and this will automatically trigger the medication to be released. Some people, they have difficulty synchronizing with this uh, inhalation. Uh, so they are, especially the children, maybe we can use this spacey device. This is another uh, device. Uh, there is a capsule with medication that is loaded and patient takes and uh, the, through the inhaler. The, I mean, patient sucks medicine through this. There are various devices, the same principle that medicine, which is, which may be a bronch, beta 2 agonist, short acting or long acting, or it could be short acting or long acting, uh, labas or lamas, and they all go to the airways directly. This is nebulizer. How is it different than inhaler? It is a machine which requires battery uh, power and medicine is put in this chamber and then patient puts this mask on the face and this will deliver medicine over like 10-15 minutes. Inhaler is just a instantaneous delivery. Patient may not be able to synchronize and whereas this one is more effective. So during severe attack, nebulizer is better, but inhalers, they have advantage of portability. So patient can use both uh, as needed. Prevention of acute attacks is our aim. So we should avoid triggers and inhale corticosteroids, low dose or medium dose or high dose, depending upon the severity of attacks then inhale steroid with long acting beta 2 agonist or long acting uh, 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 muscarinic receptor antagonist. Uh, then leukotriene inhibitors. This is a drug which is uh, available in the form of tablet. Effect is actually slightly unpredictable. Inhaled corticosteroids are definitely more effective in preventing attacks of asthma, but in some patient, we also give Montelukast, typically 10 mg a day in adults. Aminophylline, the slow release is given theophylline, that is also effective. So these are all preventive treatments. Immunotherapy is a relatively new treatment. This desensitization techniques are old ones, but I'm not sure how effective they are. In this, the allergen is injected in an increasing dose over a long period, six months, one year, and we hope that body will learn not to react to this allergen. So this is called desensitization. But these days, we have these monoclonal antibodies. They address specific uh, antigens, the allergens, 
uh, usually in the form of injection, usually very, very expensive. And these are reserved for those patients who do not respond to conventional uh, and cheap medication. Treatment of acute severe attack, uh, hospitalization may be helpful because you never know when patient uh, develops a respiratory failure. Hospitalization is very useful and uh, patients are given oxygen and patients are given nebulization with the solbutamol and a protropium and then sometimes parental bronchodilators, theophylline or beta agonists are given and short course of steroids oral if patient is able to take or injectable if patient is more serious. Usually a short burst of steroid for a few days is enough. We must try to avoid long-term systemic steroids because they have side effects. They have problem. So we, in a cure setting, of course, uh, we accept, uh, accept a side effect against benefits, uh, but in long-term uh, oral steroids are avoided and ventilation very severe cases would require intubation and ventilation and this is we are talking about severe cases of status asthmaticus status asthmaticus oxygen nebulization iv steroid and then we monitor their oxygen we monitor their arterial blood gases magnesium sulfate this is something which can help in some severe cases Magnesium sulfate can be given intravenously and some refractory cases it may do wonders. Then artificial ventilation in very severe cases. Controversial treatment antibiotics are generally not recommended. Although triggering factor in asthma is usually some infection and but, but mostly this infection is viral. So antibiotics usually are not useful although it is a common practice to prescribe them. Mass cell stabilizer, desensitization techniques, antihistamines, there is no definite role. Bronchial thermoplasty, this is a procedure which is offered to most uh, refractory cases and it has got some side effects also and not available in our country. Complications, patient may get exhausted and may result in respiratory failure, status systematicus, respiratory failure, atelectasis, pneumothorax, and COPD. Normally, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is a separate disease, but asthma, if not managed properly, will become more and more irreversible. So, practically, it becomes a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So, I think we should try to prevent that. There may be actual overlap of asthma and COPD, but what I intend to say here is that asthma becomes more and more irreversible. So that is practically COPD. Prognosis, uh, chronic recurrent attacks. There is no definite cure. We have a number of therapies, very useful, but there is no definite cure. But generally with the time, uh, it, 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 it occurs in childhood, but it typically improves with time and with time one is likely to have fewer and fewer attacks and less and less fewer attacks and ultimately patient may recover. Even then, occasional attacks are possible. So the prognosis is variable. Uh, most patients have chronic symptomatology, but some may actually, it may prove fatal in some cases, especially if not managed properly. So that was it about bronchial asthma. I hope I have given you good account of this common condition and you are now better equipped to handle this case uh, in a more efficient way because if not treated properly, it may prove fatal. Now to sum up, asthma is a condition which is characterized by paroxysm of dyspnea, wheeze and cough and primary aim is prevention by controlling trigger factors, the environment control and also by long term use of low dose inhaled corticosteroid, sometimes with long acting muscarinic receptor agonists and sometimes with Montelocast. 
so with that we hope that attacks do not occur frequently and once attack occur then we treat it with parental steroids and uh, oxygen uh, and bronchodilators thank you very much for your patient listening i hope to see you in my next video which is also going to be on another condition in respiratory diseases thank you